Well, hello, and welcome to our special Valentine's edition of Coffee Chat, uh, ASD in Marriage. I'm Kat Lee, and I'm an RDI Program Certified Consultant. So today we're going to talk about a topic uh, that I think a lot of times is thought about but not discussed in the ASD community, and that is how autism affects marriages of the parents of the children diagnosed. And just want to welcome everybody here today and those who are also joining us in the archives. And we're just, coffee chat is informal, uh, a visit. So anytime you want to pop in with a comment, please do. And uh, we'll all just visit about um, how autism affects marriage. I should tell you right away, I'm no expert. Uh, I'm a mom, my son is now 22, and here's our little family. Um, that's my daughter venturing into the waters of marriage <laughs> three years ago. Um, so it was kind of an appropriate, appropriate uh, photo, I thought. And um, I've been married, goodness, in April, it'll be 28 years to, uh, you know, it's true, it sounds kind of uh, hooky, I guess, but uh, my best friend. Brian, and uh, and I can tell you uh, that there are just in general a lot of stresses on marriage, but that uh, having your child be uh, very ill with autism is a big stress on on all your relationships. Uh, and I and I want to know your thoughts. Uh, would you agree with me that the stress of autism on marriage is not often discussed? Um, it seems to me. My son being 22, and I found out um, his diagnosis when he was two, just kind of in the journey along with friends I met along the way, that it was just not something that folks talked about very much, yet there's an underlying understanding that when anything like this happens to children, it puts a stress on the marriage. And so uh, share with me your thoughts on why you think people might not talk about it too much. What would be the reasons that something could be going on like this, this is not discussed. It's actually not even written about, and there's not very much research on it, which is very interesting. And so as parents, I just wonder what you think the reasons might be uh, that, and it may be pretty simple, that folks don't talk about the stress. Uh, I wonder sometimes if people feel like, if they're having trouble, they're the only ones having trouble. Uh, does anybody else, you know, have this problem? Am I the only one? Maybe I'm the only one who just can't handle everything. I don't know. It's just a, a thought I had. Di says, I think because the main focus is actually on the child. As a mother, that child is more important in the beginning. No, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, when this happens, you know, when when this diagnosis occurs, however we want to say that today, um, I think the focus just zooms in. You know, when you have children, that happens anyway, but then one of them is hurt, it's just this intensity. And as we know with ASD, it's not an intensity that necessarily lets up. I remember Di reading a, a book right after diagnosis, somebody suggested a book, by a psychologist, I can't remember who it was, but he said, um, it takes, this is what he said, it takes about two weeks for life to go back to kind of a normal rhythm after a child is diagnosed. And I remember thinking, and this was when my son was newly diagnosed, I, I what? <laughs> when will life ever go back to normal? I mean, I really thought it was, and I don't know, I still, to this day, I don't know what he meant by that, it was meant to be a helpful book, uh, but I thought, I don't know when that will ever happen. I remember thinking that at the time. So I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I did not find that to be true. <laughs> oh gosh, more like seven years, really. I mean, um, so I, I don't know if that was wishful thinking on his part when he wrote that, or if he was just talking about falling into a pattern of life. But one thing that I have found is that with this diagnosis, it's hard to establish a pattern of, of life uh, like other folks have. So um, with our partners, we have to 
figure out how to move on in our relationships. And one thing I, I wanted to say is, while marriage is our topic, especially with Valentine's, it's, it's true that it affects all of our relationships. Uh, not everybody being affected knows that's what's affecting the relationship, like some friendships and that type of thing. So feel free to discuss those two this morning. So there's Brian and me. <laughs> that's on the Winnie the Pooh ride at Disneyland. We're big Disneyland fans in Disneyland, California. So uh, I thought I would show that as we go whenever we can. And we're going to um, go this Valentine's, uh, myself and my husband and my son. My daughter can't make it this time, though. It's her favorite, favorite place to go. But uh, this is, I'm just going to divert just for a second so you all know that in the family consultation program, uh, this is actually a goal, 3.2.2. Make sure you have reserved time for yourself. And all of your parents, stop laughing. <laughs> you think, when would I have time for myself? But it is a goal that we have um, because we want parents to think about themselves, their relationships, because it's like feeding yourself, you know, getting cut off socially from you know, others you care about is almost a starvation. And we see a lot of parents, and I have as a, as a mom experienced and had other friends who are moms, um, become very isolated. And so this is a goal that we, we go over with families, thinking about their schedules, do they have somebody they're having coffee with, um, that type of thing. But I kind of added to it, make sure you have reserved time for yourself and your relationships, because relationships do take nurturing. They do take time. And when you have a child who is hurt in this way, that is taking a lot of time too. Time is a resource. And I found as a mom that it would be eaten up. And I actually had to have pretty understanding friends in my life. And in all honesty, uh, some folks that I had spent time with kind of fell away because it took extra effort for them to maintain a relationship with me. And then others, but particularly two women that I've known a long, long time and still do, really stepped up and tried to make uh, getting together even just for a few minutes on a regular basis possible when I couldn't carry that load as much. So things such as driving right over to just to my house or I had them come from, you know, we would meet in the middle usually before all this, they would come over. Instead of doing that, they would adjust their schedules, understand when I canceled more than I saw them. So I guess you could say in that sense, I, I don't really, I know it kind of pops into our mind to say, well, they were, um, you found out who your friends were. And I don't really think the other people weren't. I think it's just, it's a double up on investment of friendship when you have to go that extra mile. Uh, so we're really talking about marriage this morning, but I wanted to make sure that you felt comfortable talking about other relationships you had too. I am no expert on this. I've uh, been married for 28 years in April. And I wanna tell you a little bit about ourselves before we got married. So I was working in radio and TV and I, my job was my life. I loved it. I did an on-air morning show with a partner and then I worked on promotions and I would go into work at four and run home and change in the afternoon and then go out to promotions at night and get to bed at 12. And I mean, I, my life was the radio station and I loved it. And so, uh, and my husband is a geologist and he spent a lot of his time out on well sites doing what they called at that time sitting the well. So I knew when we got married that our time together was going to be limited. And I was really, I was really concerned about it because I was telling him this morning, I said, I'd been paying attention to relationships and what worked and what didn't. And one thing I thought I saw was that you needed to spend time together. And, and that if you didn't have time, if you never saw the person, you never had time to nurture the relationship. So um, he felt the same way and he could certainly see that with my job. And so when we got married, we decided, despite the fact that we were, lived together and were married, <laughs> we would set aside a time once a week for a date. And even when we would had time that week, we would still have that date at a regular time. Of course, this is pre-children. And we decided to get in that pattern because we knew when we did have children, it would get even more so. 
So he had, and, and I asked him permission to tell this story, but he had been married when he was really young. He was a high school sweetheart. And he had told me in our friendship, we were very good friends before we ever fell in love. And uh, he told me that he felt one of the things that he didn't do was spend time with her. He would go play basketball with his buddies and have what we think was me time, he said, but he took it to a place where he knew that he had hurt her. The long and short of it is, and again, I have his permission to share this, is that she um, got together with her boss and divorced him, completely shocked him, divorced him, and left him. And that had left him as a young man very mindful about what he felt he had done that had hurt that relationship, and one of them was not spend time. That he loved her and wanted to spend time with her, but he didn't think it was a big deal to spend a lot of time with somebody else. So what I wanted to share our personal story uh, was just so you know that we both had this sense of urgency before we ever had children that we didn't want that to happen. Um, and I thought I couldn't really speak to the subject with you guys without being up front with you. Now, there is not a lot of research on this topic, uh, but 80% of the, the national rate in our country, this is the United States, as first marriages is 40 to 50% divorce rates. With parents, the children with ASD uh, is said to be as high as 80%. So I guess you guys would agree with me. That's really high. I definitely, you know, as I moved along as a consultant, have seen this happen to families. Um, it's, it's very sad uh, to watch folks go through this, of course, and struggle and try to not have this happen. But 80% is awfully high. I guess we would agree. I'm going to be quoting from Allison Walmart today. You can look her up if you want to. This particular article called Living the American Dream. Um, it's, it's a really funny article. She's a mom. She's a writer. And she's a mom um, whose child was diagnosed with ASD. And I'm going to quote a little bit from her today. And um, this webinar is just slightly PG-13 for a minute because of something she said, but I thought it would give you guys a, a laugh. But I liked her article because it was very real, and she was writing about her real life with her lovely husband. So a little bit of the writing I put here today uh, was lengthy, but I wanted to um, have some things to discuss with you that were real life, because that's what we're experiencing. This was written in 2013 in her article, and she was saying that they'd be married nine years, uh, and they were living the version of the American dream which has really changed over the years, but when I was growing up, it was the uh, picket fence and the nice four bedroom house and the, you know, uh, the 2.5 kids or something like that. Um, but their, their son, their, their child was diagnosed with ASD and she writes about having her home and, and I thought it was hilarious. This is the PG-13 part. She said they got a minivan which sucks out every last ounce of my sexuality. That's what she said. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys, I laughed so hard when I read that. Oh, the old minivan. I got rid of mine as fast as I could. And she says that, um, you know, her husband will ask her to curtail their spending as much as they can. And in her article, if you go read it, she talks about just how hard it is, you know, um, getting her son to his various therapies and the time that she has to spend doing that and the time that he has to spend doing that and it's just not a lot of time for each other. This is part of her article and she talks about that a big part of this is that children who have special needs require much more attention and that parents focus so much on their child that they forget that it was the two of them that came first together. Uh, everyone's extremely busy and when there's a child with special needs, the demands on your time becomes really great. This is why I like this relationship, this particular article. Time for the relationship and time for yourself are the first to go. Uh, however, this could change if you realize the true importance and great benefit that you and your relationship will get from carving out such time on a regular basis, which is what Allison did. It's important to create that connection with your partner to make time for yourselves in your relationship. Just as your child has special needs, so does your relationship. To keep your relationship together, you can't forget that. You need to create time for that. You also need to have time for yourselves. Both men and women need time for themselves, time to be with the children, and time to be together without the children. 
If you can space out the timing in this way, your chance of having a thriving marriage will be much greater. So this morning we're talking a lot about that really valuable resource time. So this is one of the research um, articles published in the journal Family Psychology, the relative risk uh, and timing of divorce in families of children with autism spectrum disorder concluded divorce rate for parents with children with ASD is higher. Ta-da! And she said this in her article, you all, that, you know, that the conclusion just seemed so obvious. Now, that's not all. In May 2011, the Journal of Autism Development Disorders published some research, and it said that um, it's the same rate as for parents with neurotypical children. And she found that pretty unlikely, but the research is there, and I wanted to share with you what's out there. And this is pretty much it right now. I didn't see anything else. Uh, sometimes I'll get surveyed on research you know, folks doing work and, and, and that kind of thing. So maybe there'll be some more studies published. But I don't know if we need a study to tell us that autism is stressful in marriages and how those marriages can end. So we'll keep our eye out on that. So that's me and Brian. That's up in the uh, Canadian Rockies. Just popping in a few pictures of us here and there. So this is from John Gray. He's the best-selling author of Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And I just, I was looking for different folks to talk. So I wanted to share from one mom. And then I wanted to share from John Gray just because I found some writings on his on parents with special needs children. And he says, the stakes are huge when you and your spouse feel that your child's future is on the line. This is the time to remember that communication is key to understanding each other, to respect each other, and to uh, taking advantage of each other's wisdom and intuition. And I think that really is true for the benefit of your child. Loving, positive, respectful communication is also the road for staying in love and deepening your connection in the face of the inevitable stress, exhaustion, and perhaps even fear and confusion. Every time you experience any of the above, remember, communication, communication, communication. So I wanted to share this with you because I thought, John Gray, that was really good advice. And actually, you can go online and he's written a lot more on uh, being, a parent, being a parent and having a special needs child. So I wanted to share that resource with you. So he writes really prettily. But you know, to communicate, you have to have time. So uh, think about your time. Think about, do you spend time with your spouse? What kind of time do you plan? Usually there's one who is the planner in the relationship. So think about who that is in your, in your marriage. So one thing I loved about RDI when I came into it, which was goodness, about 12 years ago, was that I didn't find it just helped my son. I felt it helped me and I thought it was really good for marriages and other relationships because the principles really um, apply. And many times when I get a new family, I will tell them it's great for marriages and I'll just give them example. A lot of times on the communication. So we'll talk about communicating and they'll both look at each other and go, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So I think the principles apply. And I don't know how many of you today have gone through the different points in the family consultation program goals. And I don't want you to worry about it if you haven't been over one of these yet. I'm sure you will. Uh, but there's some basic ones that I think can apply to our marriages. And one of those can be slowing down, slowing down, you know, looking at our schedules. So we know we start RDI, we look at our schedules and we try to take out anything we're doing that we don't absolutely have to do. So it's kind of, I call it de-junking our schedule. Now, as a mom, I feel like I would not have anything going on that I wouldn't have to do. But I did find that taking a look, actual a paper look, like, you know, a schedule look, actually helped me be sure of that. Is there anything I'm doing that I don't need to be doing that I don't even realize I'm doing? I kind of call it being life blind. Have you guys heard of house blindness, where you can have a corner that you put a box in that corner and then stack something on top of it, and I'm going to get to that later, and then eventually it just kind of is there. I have one right now, right in that direction, um, that I didn't mean to leave like that. 
So I think we can also be life blind when it comes to our schedule and have something going on that we really don't need to be doing anymore or haven't really thought through why we're doing it. And that's part of the slowing down process. And why is that necessary for our relationships? Because when we're finding ourselves not having time, it could be that if we would take a look, kind of a step back and look at a schedule, literally look at a schedule, we would see we would have a, fra a fraction of time there for that relationship, could be. Focusing on the process, so marriage is definitely a process. I can tell you that for me, it's definitely been a process looking back. Now, when I got married, I wouldn't have known that. I think they're just things you can't know until you go through them. But there's daily products, right? <laughs> and then there's the process. And you look back and you can see it's been a process. So thinking about that, you know, one day has to define that process, just like with our kids. It's nice to get good little products, but they're building up to a process. Uh, we talk in RDI about communication and watching out how imperative we are. And I want to point out something that's not often talked about is that sometimes imperative and directive communication has come about in, out of need. Because if we said, oh, wouldn't it be so pleasant and nice if someone happened to would pick up lovely their shoes? <laughs> it wouldn't happen. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we get in a habit of being imperative. And I know I really have had this happen in my life with myself to my family. So one thing RDI did for me was really made me be more mindful about when I was being imperative and directive. Now, I'm gonna say a generality that I don't, I don't like to generalize too much, put everybody in a box. So I'll just say that some of the imperative I would be with my children would rub off onto me being that way with my husband. <laughs> Cause it's just this habit that one can get into. So I've tried to be more mindful about how I communicate and think about that. And I'm not saying that's just women. I think that works both ways. Uh, that, can, that, that So I'm a woman, so I'm speaking from a woman's point of view, but I think it can work both ways. That, that imperative communication can start to become a habit because we're using it with our children. So reducing it mindfully across the board is good, but I think particularly with spouses to be thought, to be thinking about how much how much am I out of balance? We talk a lot about that in RDI with my imperatives way up here and my experience sharing down here because with our spouses, our experience sharing needs to be much higher. So that's something that I've tried to do and, and it's a process. So some days are not as good as others I am confessing to you. Spending time together. So I shared at the beginning how we established this date pattern before we ever had children. And then we had children and we, we knew, again, I felt we felt this heightened sense of concern. We watched friends of ours stop spending time together and having struggles. So we decided to keep our date time and figure that out. And that, you know, was a challenge because if you're going to uh, not be with the children, that means somebody else is going to be with them and you feel comfortable with that. And all of those things, yes, that was difficult, but we just committed ourselves to it and continued that. And I'll come back to time together in a little bit, but thinking through that. Where I was going with RDI's time together is something we look at for the kids. So when children and parents come to us, we see a lot of times that they're not actually having time together, that they're in so many therapies and schools and clinics and et cetera, that the parents and the children are not having time together. We find this in the relationship of the parents as well. So here again, the RDI principles apply. Update yourself, so in RDI, again, if you haven't gotten to this yet, it's okay, but we think about the decisions we've made with our children and then we update ourselves. So did that decision work, did it not work? Um, why do we do that? Because first of all, it's just, I have to tell you, it's changed my life overall and everything I do, but uh, with our children, we're trying to figure out the best way to guide them, right? So we're, we, watch our guiding and we evaluate ourselves without judgment, of course. And then we go, okay, that didn't work. So I'm going to do this or that really worked. I'm going to do more of that. 
And so I find that's really helped me in my relationship with my wonderful Brian, because I think about that with him. Um, I don't want you to think I just think about it all the time, but I do think about it. It's kind of become a part of how I think about relationships, not just with him or my son or my daughter with other folks too. In RDI, we talk about scaffolding. So when it comes to the children, uh, we talk about the help they need, and this is how I think of it, the help they need in the process and what they don't need. So when we think about it with our children, I think about am I over scaffolding my son? Am I under? Does he need more support uh, or not? So that's a general definition of scaffolding. Um, if you've not come to that yet, that's okay. But it's, I think of it as that support, that help, or not that may be needed. And so I think about that in my relationship with my husband as well. What support does he need? And again, I am no superhero in this, believe me. I could tell you stories. So, but I think about it. What does he need? What does he not need? You know, what support does he not need? Because that could happen too, kind of an overmanagement. Uh, and try to think about how to help our marriage along. What support does it need from me? And what does it not need from me? So I apply the principle of scaffolding there as well. You know, thinking about roles, and those aren't dinner roles, that should have been the roles of life. <laughs> I must have been hungry. Um, you know, what are your roles gonna be um, in terms of parenting and in terms of each other who has want responsibilities? So that's important and that's important to talk about together. And really all of these things can be important to talk about together, but some are very personal changes versus those that you can discuss. But thinking about your roles, but not just parenting roles, but your roles in relationship to each other. What is my role in my marriage? What is my role in my marriage? And I think a lot of folks don't think about that that much, especially after you've been married a while, you just almost get in a routine, whether that rather that routine may not be optimal, but it's the routine that you can get in. And then this one is a, is a big one. And Brian and I talk about this one often, only in RDI with this term, you know, with RDI came this term for us, but this is a really important topic, which is watching out for the static. Now, my daughter, I told you guys in the beginning is married, sometimes has accused us of being static. She'd be like, well, you guys only like to go to, uh, you guys go to this restaurant or whatever. Um, and I would be like, because we have really good memories together at that restaurant. And so what we know is, right, we're building on those experience-based memories and we like those memories. But I think it can be important too to also experience the dynamic. And I'm not talking, you know, it could be, it could be a trip to Fiji. I haven't gone there, but you know, people have. Um, but I'm actually talking about just trying out a new place for coffee or dinner, doing something different can help with um, breaking any patterns or routines that you might feel that you needed to. So watching out for the static, and this could probably be a whole topic itself for another coffee chat. What is static in relationships? Uh, what is not static? When is static good? When is static not good? Uh, when we talk about dynamic, and you all know in RDI uh, that dynamic intelligence, dynamic living is something we really talk about that we're trying to provide for the children, but we have to be a model of that ourselves. And if we get into the static, that's actually not healthy for them because they need the model of folks living a dynamic life. However, uh, it is true. I told you I have a 25 year old daughter, so you can kind of start thinking about how old I might be. Um, that as folks get older, they do tend to become more static and routine. And I always think, and I don't know how you guys feel about this, but we know that static is comforting. We know that we have kids, and I, I see them as a consultant, who lean toward the static, whether it be their routine or where something is sitting in a room or, or how somebody says something. I've had children with all kinds of static comforts, um, and that static can be very comforting. So I think, again, not seeing research on this, but I think that parents fall to the static um, because of the distress and the, the, the concern is overwhelming. So static helps. 
So I think that sometimes we have to have static to comfort ourselves, just like the kids do. But we have to be careful about it in our marriages uh, because it could be unhealthy for them if we're too static. So let me know if you want to talk more about that. But that's where these are where I took RDI principles and have been applying them to my relationship with my husband and to myself and my other relationships as well. Okay, these are just tips from me to you guys. <laughs> Again, I'm no authority on marriage um, at all. I've just claimed myself, haven't I? I'm just a mom. Feel free to ask me questions for me as a mom. Um, I've got my coffee right here, so it's a coffee chat. So these are written in mom too, by me as mom. Um, I think it's really good to recognize, or I felt like it was that there is a threat to our marriages. Um, and it's not, anybody's, you know, nobody's meaning to do that, but um, this um, ASD is a threat because of everything we talked about, what um, Allison talked about uh, with time and the re as a resource and being taken away from us. So with that in mind, I think it's important to have a plan. Uh, I think we can want to do things, but if we don't actually sit down with a plan of how we're going to do it, um, it can become difficult. When my son was little, when he was really little, we would have somebody come and take care of both of the children when we went out, and sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't, but we pursued it constantly, you know, making sure we, the same person. Um, we felt that was important anyway for our children if we were going to be gone. We tried as much as possible. My, my husband's parents and my parents-in-law come to town sometimes, so we would do, uh, they, they would take care. But we, we had people we trusted um, outside of them since they didn't live there. But actually, after some years, they actually came and lived here, and they would come. My father-in-law was in his favorite thing to go out at night and take care of the children, but my mother-in-law loved it. So they would come over, and sometimes we got to go, and sometimes we didn't. My son had major sleep problems, so if he couldn't go to sleep before we left, we didn't get to go out. But we were always planning to try to do that once a week. Like I said, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but we had that in our mind to do that because we, we felt like she couldn't handle it if he, he couldn't go to sleep, essentially. So I'm being honest and saying I know there's problems with all of this. Then as he got older, my daughter got older, and I mean quite a bit older, they would stay together. And that worked, but then she got married. And my son is doing great, and um, it's a lot of and every day I'm amazed at just the process and his improvement. But he's, he's speech delays, articulation is very poor, so we don't care to just leave him alone uh, should something happen and somebody wouldn't understand what he was trying to say if he called 911 or something. So my, my daughter had moved away, and so we started trying to have lunch together once a week. And actually, when you think that wouldn't be as romantic as going out at night, <laughs> but actually it's been very, very fun to do that. But it takes effort, and I'm going to get down to that in just a minute. So I want to just share with you our, our own life that we've been in this continual pursuit of spending time together as best we could. Implement your plan as best you can, and if it doesn't work, don't feel like you failed. Just keep your eye on the ball, and don't stress yourself, but keep it in, in line, keep the goal in mind, because it's when it slips out of mind that you don't have a plan anymore. Okay, here's a big one. This is a big one I've seen with my friends, both friends with a, kids with ASD, but without, with just friends with tip, typical children. Recognize that one of you may be better at planning and be okay with that. So I asked you earlier to think about who in your relationship is the planner, and in mine, it's me. And my sweet husband has actually said to me, just spontaneously over the years, every once in a while he'll say, He'll say, thank you for not being mad at me because you're the one who plans our, our dates. <laughs> and he would tell me that some of the women in his work would tell him how mad they were at their husbands. And he really was glad I wasn't that mad at him. And uh, I said, well, I said, I even used to let you plan our vacations, but some of the places we stay, you, <laughs> he said, they weren't that bad. <laughs> but it doesn't bother me because he, he's very, when he's there, he's so happy to be there and enthusiastic. And so I recognize that. I'm not bragging on myself. I'm not saying I'm great at this, 
but uh, planning is a big part of my life with my work. And so I've, I've been for a long time the one who arranges. However, when Brian's parents were younger and our children were younger and they came over, he talked to them about that. So those roles can switch around. But it's important not to, to try not to resent if you feel like you're the one making that effort. Resilience, we talk a lot about that in RDI. Um, your resilience in all your relationships can get beat down. Anybody ever feel that way? We talk about the kids needing to build resilience. That's one of the things we're in the process of building and everybody I'm sure here acknowledges that takes time. I've watched my own son develop resilience in solving problems, and but it's been a process. And so having resilience yourself, you need to do a, a resilience thermometer and see where it is and think about what you can do to build it and how you can help each other because when you're trying to work, move toward goals like having time together or communicating and that's just not working, your resilience can really get beat down. But talking about it and what you can do to support each other and, and realizing that's what's going on. I think a lot of times people don't know that they're just getting their resilience is getting beat down. I don't know how many friends I talk to, both with neurotypical and with children with special needs, don't really realize that's what's happened to them, that the resilience has been eaten up. But thinking about that and ways to build it. Helping each other, um, I consider working on the scheduling of our time together with my husband helping him. He really wants to have that time. And I feel good that I do that, but I look at that as helping him, not as you know, something he's putting on me. And he certainly helps me. Some ladies laugh because my husband is really, a, he's a geologist by trade, he's a scientist, but he loves, I mean, he'll send me a picture of a dress and say, do you think you would like and need this dress? I think it's nice, I'll, I'll, I'll get it for you. <laughs> and my friends will go, oh, I like that dress. Where did you get that? I go, oh, I don't know, my husband got it for me. <laughs> he helps me because he knows I don't have a lot of time for that. <laughs> and they'll go, <laughs> they'll go, oh, your husband picked that out for you? I could never wear something. <laughs> I hope the men here today are not offended <laughs> that my husband picked out. My husband's a really good shopper for me, but that really helps me. So he helps me as much as I help him. And yeah, you'll just, he cracks me up actually, you know, I'll open an email and there'll be a dress. My mom's given me her china and my great aunt's china. And let's just say we have dishes that we, we don't know what to do with, but we can't feel like we could just not have them. And so we moved last year and finally had a house that had a place for a hutch. And I've never had a hutch. I was like, I don't really know what I do to the hutch. Anyway, it came and I meant to get the china in there. Anyway, I came in and he was putting the china in the hutch and getting it all organized. You know, it looks beautiful. And I said, that is just what I love about you. You are just so artsy. I mean, you had it all arranged. I said, you could have done so many careers. You're a scientist, but you could have been a hutch arranger, designer person. Anyway, it was helping me. I wasn't having time to do it. I didn't. I'm not feel artsy. Again, he was helping me. I just told you that my husband's really good at things like like decorating, like with the china. It really looks cool the way he set it up in there. That's not particularly my strong suit. Some of you with us today, that might be your strong suit, but it's not mine. And I was thrilled. I was like, wow, that looks really good. <laughs> I know it looks good though. <laughs> I thought that looked really good. So, but thinking about that, how to help each other, that can be a really big deal. And one thing to remember is that even if somebody says it doesn't really matter to them if you help them, some people will say that. It reminds me of a friend of mine who told me that his wife told him he, she doesn't need anything for Valentine's. And I was like, really? And you believe that? I mean, people will say that, but when you go and, this is anybody, when you go and do, it means something to them. Whether they would say, yes, I must have this or that, they mean that. They mean, I don't need that to love you. I don't need that for relationships. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean something that they do do it. You guys see what I'm saying? It's like one doesn't really have that much to do with the other. Of course, if you're in a financial pinch and, you know, your wife is saying, don't worry about getting me a dozen roses, honey. Um, I know we are in the financial pinch and you know I know you love me and all that. I still say you can go buy one rose. Very romantic. So there's things you can do.
or make something. I think I love things people have made for me. Oh, my husband's sounding so artsy, but he's over the years, he's written me a couple of poems just out of nowhere. So I'm not saying that, I mean, I don't write poems. <laughs> I don't sound very romantic, do I? But <laughs> so, you know, made things. My sister gave me a piece of pottery she made for Christmas. I think they're some of the most meaningful. I don't know how you guys feel. It's really the thought and thoughtfulness, I think, that's what's important. Talking is very important. <laughs> so in RDI, we talk about all the all the communication bandwidths are. So they are, our nonverbal language can say a ton to our spouses, but also communicating the what's coming out of your mouth can be very, very important and making sure it, it is, and I'm saying talking, real talking takes place outside of an event because sometimes things can get heated or disagreements. So talking about your relationship can be very important in what's going on. And to do that, you have to spend some time together. I know folks who, when they spend time together, they don't talk about, their rule is they don't talk about autism at all. And if that's a rule you need to set, then set it. And whatever you need to set around your boundaries together, set that. I know in our case, sometimes we felt like we needed to talk about that. We both had a need, so we didn't put that rule on ourselves. But if you do need to do that, then do it. You know, I think that's a, a choice that you've got to kind of personally make. So those are tips for me. And if you're not doing some of these things, you shouldn't feel badly. So the purpose of this little chat this morning is just so that we're talking about them. Because as we said in the beginning when we started, I don't find folks talking about the stress that autism brings to the marriage. And I do think it brings a unique stress different from other stresses. And I think that's normal. So I know lots of folks with special needs child, children, not autism, and they have their stresses too. But autism is unique, as, as all, all these things are, and it has its own stresses on, on relationships and on family members. So I didn't want you to feel alone if you've had that or you have concerns. As far as the folks in RDI, because a lot of times I get asked this that I know, that I know, we don't have any data on if you're, if people have actually asked this question, if families in RDI, do they have less of a divorce rate than families not? That would, that'd be really hard research to do. But I can tell you that over the 12 years that I have been a consultant, while they're with me, you know, there's a few families I've lost contact with, but when, and I've kept in contact with a whole lot of them. I believe it's only one or two families that have ended up divorced. I do think working together on a program like RDI, like as a team, I think team, this is important. And a couple of the authors talked about that, that looking at it as a, a, a team, it was important. However, I need to tell you that I've had moms who had to that I had to have it kind of go it alone. And I've had a dad or two that had to kind of go it alone in RDI. It wasn't as, as team like they would like. And they did a fabulous job. So if you're in that situation, don't want you to feel badly today. It's not that's not unusual. However, the, the counseling was by Mr. Mr. Gray earlier was that if you can approach it as a team and as a team, as a as we call in RDI, a we go, that's the best way. On the other side of that, um, people are damaged when their children are hurt. And so sometimes one partner, I would say is more damaged because I think that could belittle the feelings of the other partner is not being as damaged, but it, the effects can be different. And so we have to recognize that too. And then, and I'm sure you guys have at least seen this in, in parents that you know, friends of yours who are married, you know, you can need to seek out counseling. Unfortunately, as I've observed my friends through the years, a lot of times one of the, the partners won't go uh, to counseling. And that can be very, very difficult when the other is pursuing or wants to pursue and the other will not do it. But if, if you're having struggles and you both can agree to it, it can be very helpful. I know that from uh, watching, watching it be helpful. So if anybody here is struggling that way, 
um, and things about that after our webinar today. Don't want you to feel badly if you feel like you might need to do that. I don't want you guys to, to think that we're some kind of super heroes or stuff. It's been very hard for us to get that in. I would say, especially right now, we've been having a lot of trouble just because of our work schedules. But what I said earlier, it's a goal. So because it's a goal and because we think it's important, we just continue to pursue that time together and it does happen. I think it's when it gets off the table and then far, far away that it gets more difficult and we sometimes have to just sit down and say, this is something that we're going to do. We're gonna start doing this. Kind of like, not to, not to make it seem small, but kind of like exercise or anything else. I'm gonna, today's a new day and I'm going to start this new goal. So if you haven't been doing that and you're thinking this morning, I'd, I'd like to try, don't think that you can't, it can be done. And it may be that one of you has to take the, the helm, so to speak, to make sure it happens. And I will tell you too, that now I'm really sharing that I, before we ever got a diagnosis, you know, we were doing this and I would have friends of mine say, my husband and I don't need to do that. That's not something we need to do. I felt like they were making fun of me, <laughs> but it, so that's okay if you don't, if you don't think so. But what I would said was, well, it's not like, you know, we achieve that every time, but it's a goal to be together, just the two of us. And if we don't set the goal, then we won't be just the two of us at all. And that's, I always thought it was logical that that's how we came together, just the two of us. So we wanted to make sure we kept that relationship strong for our children. That was before ASD, but I did have definitely had friends who disagreed with me on that point. And there we are. That's on, the, we go out on the lake. I start tubing for the first time a couple of years ago. I go very slow on the tube. <laughs> it's kind of like skiing, but not. You're laying down on a tube. So definitely not standing up. Well, I really appreciate you being here today. And if everybody thinks we're finished, we can go ahead and, oh, you're very welcome. Thank you everybody for joining. I'm so, so glad to have you here on this topic that I think we don't talk about enough. And happy Valentine's. I hope you guys get to do something special for Valentine's Day.